please, uh, we're going to start uh, today's lesson back in the book of Daniel. If you go with me to Daniel chapter 9. And of course, uh, it's eschatology. This is uh, uh, part number 11. Right, Brother Carlos? Yes, Amen. <laughs> Brother Carlos and I are on the, on the same number now. Um, okay, so, um, we're, uh, eschatology, this is part number 11. We've been talking about the beast and the false prophet. And uh, let me just move this out of the way real quick. And we've been talking about the beast and the false prophet the last couple of weeks. And uh, we see we see them. Uh, we were in actually, uh, Revelation 13 for a little bit. Uh, back in Revelation chapter 11. Uh, you also see some, um, yeah, I think we'll be in chapter 11 for a little bit today. But we see the beast and the false prophet. Uh, all, all, of course, also referred to as the Antichrist. And of course, the false prophets referred to as, as the second beast or another beast, as he's mentioned there. And we see them, and as we talked about last week, we talked about one, like one world government, one world religion. Um, today we're going to be talking about, as you can see in the outline, it's called the big switch. Um, and that's, we find that back in Daniel chapter 9. And so uh, we're just going to read one verse, we're going to have a word of prayer, and then get to our lesson today. Daniel chapter 9, verse number 27. And he, that he there, is referring to uh, the prince of the people, which is also the Antichrist, um, talking about the Antichrist here, okay? And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of, the, of the abomination he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Let's pray. Father, just thank you, Lord, for the occasion to meet together this morning. It's the Lord's Day, and it's... Uh, just a wonderful time to be out together and spending time in your word. And Father, we've been talking a lot about end time things and, and certainly even events in our day and age uh, get our, our attention and the attention of, of many people uh, directed towards the end times. And I pray, Father, that we above all people would not only just be knowledgeable about what happens uh, at the end of the age, but also, Lord, that we uh, above all people would be prepared for it. And help us, Lord, to have others, help others to be prepared for it also. And introducing them to Jesus Christ, who's the only hope um, in any time uh, of world history. But even, even now, as we get closer to the end. And Father, we ask you, Lord, to guide us in all truth today. Bless the teaching of your word today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Well, in Daniel chapter 9, of course, we see Daniel's prayer, and then we see uh, that revelation. The angel comes and begins, the angel Gabriel comes, and begins to begins Daniel some instructions about the end, primarily the instructions in reference to the coming of the Messiah. He, he, that 40 weeks are determined, um, that, excuse me, 40 weeks, 70 weeks are determined, and, and so the coming of the Messiah is what's prophesied, and the fact that he'll be cut off, talking about his death. Uh, and then that last and final, which is often referred to as the 70th week of Daniel, the last group of seven that's not dealt with here um, uh, in, in reference to the Messiah is dealt with in, that, in this last portion. It's verse number 27. Of course, that's the tribulation of seven years of tribulation. And so um, what we're going to be talking about today is that event, that big switch. In other words, uh, what happens um, during this period of time. Now, we've, been, we've mentioned it a few times. We've been talking about the Antichrist, talking about the false prophet. I do want to mention this, and I know I mentioned it at the beginning of this whole series. As you, And we're not doing verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We're doing more like events throughout the Revelation. As you read through the book of Revelation, please be reminded of the fact that not it's not chronological. You don't start you know, chapter 1 and read all the way through and get this chronological thing. What you have is, is back and forth, uh, uh, things on earth, things in heaven, the stuff that, you know, you go back and forth. And sometimes the thing they speak about in heaven uh, is kind of a, a vision of an overview of things that have already happened. And so you just, you really have to be just, just kind of step back a little bit uh, and be cautious that you don't get confused about, uh, you know, you're talking about this, but I thought this already happened. Be a, just get it in your mind that things do go back and forth, that there are things on earth, things in heaven, and there are chapters that are recaps and chapters that are more like big picture chapters. 
for instance, one of the visions that John sees uh, a woman uh, having a child and the dragon goes after it. That, that is a, that, that's an overview uh, of really of, of the entire history of the nation of Israel. And, and so you see these type of things that are going on. So just be under, understand that. So as you're reading it, you don't get confused thinking, you know, I don't understand how this thing fits into the sequence. It is possible. It doesn't fit in the sequence. It is a, it's an overview or it's a vision of something in a different perspective that's already happened. So just get that in your mind, okay? So as we're talking about the Antichrist today, we're going to, we're going to talk primarily about the, uh, uh, the, the, mid, the mid part of the tribulation where you know, we've already spoken about these two. As a matter of fact, when we get later along, I think we're in chapter 11, you know, chapter 13 is where we're introduced to these folks. And so, but they're, by chapter 11, they're already in play. And so that's why it's going back and forth. We're going to talk about this mid part of the tribulation. First thing I want to mention uh, here in Daniel chapter 9, this is the big switch that takes place. The, the covenant, please notice in verse number 27. And he, talking about the Antichrist, shall, um, uh, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And so there's going to be a seven-year peace treaty um, that the Antichrist is going to be very instrumental in getting started. Now, um, I know I shared with you a couple years ago, I was taking a trip over to the UK. I was uh, flying uh, British Air, I think. No, I was flying Air Lingus, as a matter of fact. And uh, I was uh, waiting, getting my, uh, waiting for the ticket uh, counters to open up. There was another fellow that was flying over to... Um, um, flying over to Israel, and we just happened to be waiting for the booths to open up so that we could both check into our flights. And, and he was a, a Jewish fellow, he was from New York uh, originally. Um, he's just a character. He had been a police officer for years, retired from that, then, then went into teaching school uh, in the, I don't know if it was Brooklyn or Bronx or somewhere uh, there, one of the, one of the, uh, uh, one of the um, outside of Manhattan. Um, and then he's retired from that, and now he's been just traveling over the, all over the world just doing fun stuff. He had just gotten back from Alaska where he was working uh, in, a, in a tortoise trap. He was pretending he was uh, panning for gold in one of those tortoise trap places, and he's, that's where he spent the summer. Oh, that's cool. I know, that's cool, <laughs> you know? And uh, he says, yeah, my wife, she just says, just go and do it, you know? I was like, get him out of the house, all right? And so... Um, uh, so he was he was heading over to Israel to volunteer to work at a, um, a um, an archaeological site. It all volunteer work, you know. He's got a pension. He's got two pensions, you know. And so that's what he was heading over there to do and just spend whatever, uh, however long it was, just working at an archaeological site. So, you know, and I'm like, let's talk because there was just so many things. It was just fun to talk with, and so he. Um, he asked me the question. He, you know, of course, I told him who I was and what I did for a living and all those kind of things. And he asked me, "Do you ever think there'll be peace um, in the Middle East?" That was his question to me. Okay. And so, of course, my my answer uh, was, you know, pretty straightforward answer. I said, "There will never be peace in the in the Middle East until the Lord Jesus Christ returns." And he looked at me and he says, "Yeah, I figured you'd say that. I'm sure he's heard it." A zillion times before uh, from other people, and so uh, we had a nice conversation about that. And uh, of course, he was very knowledgeable about uh, uh, many of the peace attempts. Of course, true you guys. But how many? Of you, how many of you remember the Camp David Court? Jimmy Carter, Camp David, all that kind of stuff. Some of you weren't even born yet. And those are the kind of things I remember. The Oslo Accord. Uh, there's been other initiatives. Um, it seems like every every presidential. Um, administration has always worked towards a some type of peace agreement in the Middle East. It's, it's like that's that standard thing. When you become president, this is like this one's yours now. And and it seems like every of course our the, the current administration, um, you know, uh, President Trump, he of course made mentions and and worked towards that. But of course he's the only one who's ever any president's ever recognized Jerusalem. As the capital of the nation of Israel, well, duh. It, it, I'm, I'm sorry, but I look at my Bible and Jerusalem is the capital of the nation of Israel, whether it's recognized or not. But he's the only he's only 
that's the only administration that's ever done that. And of course, then moving our embassy from I think it's Tehran over to um, over to Jerusalem was a big step towards that. Also, of course, that did not help very much at all in the establishment of any kind of peace treaty with uh, the Palestinians. Um, I, I mention that only to, to say this: this is not something new. This is something that's been going on forever. Um, and there's always been tension, and the tension always revolves around the land. Um, and every treaty that's ever been dealt with has always tried to deal with that issue. Who gets the land? Uh, who can settle where? And that's always been a very, uh, this, that's always been the sticking points. And they will, they will always argue over that land. Now here's, here's the deal. Um, if you believe the Bible, then you know that the land was promised to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and to their descendants. Uh, the Palestinians don't even, don't even recognize the existence of the Jewish people as a nation and don't recognize their, their right to any portion of the land. And so anytime you have a peace treaty with, these, with the Arabs, there's a problem because you're asking them to recognize the existence of a people. That has never happened in any of the peace treaties. Now, who, I, forget, I forget the guy's name, the, the Egyptian uh, leader um, that uh, made that recognition. Of course, he was assassinated the following year by his own people. Um, and so this is the kind of this is the kind of, uh, of struggle that goes on treaty after treaty after treaty. And so it's never happened. It has never happened. There's not an Arab nation out there that recognizes just the existence of the Jewish people as a nation. So what's going to happen? And when we talk about end times, that this is this is the big deal, right? Because if you go back to that verse of scripture, it says there is going to be, he will confirm the covenant with many for one week. And so what we're talking about is a, is a, uh, a when it says that with many, we're talking about, it's not just like a, you know, a unilateral thing or just two parties. It's talking about a, a, a large treaty. So it, any treaty that affects the nation of Israel is likely going to be a treaty that is going to involve the majority of the Arab nations, if not all of the Arab nations, within the Middle East. And so there is going to be some type of treaty that, the, that everybody in that area is going to buy into. So I don't, I, you know, how does that happen? Where, I mean, where, where does it even begin to start? Um, as we talked about, uh, uh, I guess it's been months ago now, uh, we were talking about the uh, Battle of Gog and Magog. Um, here it is right here from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38 and 39. And um, I, the way I interpret that, that's a battle that takes place, uh, I believe, at, at this period of time, uh, either starting right before or happening immediately after. And... That battle is going to be set in that area, and there's going to be a lot of uh, nations involved. Either you have to look through those chapters to see exactly. And, and I believe that that is going to play in closely uh, with the first horseman of the four horsemen in, in Revelation chapter 6, where the white horse is, is there, and that one riding on the white horse with the, uh, uh, with the bow with no arrows. And I believe that is that that's going to make reference to that peace treaty. So I, what I believe is whatever takes place here is going to be settled by that first horseman, which is the Antichrist, and he is going to establish some type of covenant um, involving the nation of Israel and the surrounding nations in order to, to bring what would seem to be the final solution to peace in the Middle East. Okay. And that's what Revelation, or, uh, excuse me, that's what Daniel chapter uh, 9, verse number 27 is speaking about. A peace treaty. I want to read a verse of scripture. 
Uh, and this is from John 14, 27, that says this. This is Jesus. He said this, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, he's talking about peace, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And, and of course, this peace that we have with, uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ actually is a peace with God through Christ and through the Holy Spirit, the peace of God. This is the context here is about the giving of the Holy Spirit. And so that's what he's speaking about. But what he makes it in parallel with, of course, uh, and he, and he, uh, what he says is not as the world giveth peace. How does the world give peace would be the question. How does the world give peace? So when you think about peace as far as a worldly definition, what are we talking about? How, how do you define peace in reference to the world? Yes, sir. A lack of conflict. A lack of conflict. And that's, you know, that's an excellent definition, lack of conflict. Now, the question that has to be asked then is how do you bring about a lack of conflict? So what do you do? You destroy all of the centers, remove them, so that all you have left are the people who are either going to follow you because of fear, pressure, yeah. whatever. And that's a good observation, David. You, that's what you what do is you get, you get rid of the centers so that the only people that are left are people that, that buy into whatever, whatever peace that you're offering. Yes, sir? The other thing, too, is... Uh, I didn't even think it, but you mentioned this. In the thousand-year reign, Jesus is going to rule with a rod of iron. Yes, he will. Yes. That Satan is an, is an antichrist. He imitates Jesus. Uh -huh. Will he rod, rule with a rod of iron, too, in the seven years? I, I, would, I would have to say, yes, that is exactly the case, okay? And which brings up just a, another good observation in reference to how, how the world defines peace. A lack of conflict which can one way be brought about by the removal of anybody who opposes or by holding people in submission. Um, I mean, a great, just some great examples of that, of course, you know, just from world history, um, which, what was called Pax Romana, which is the peace of Rome. The, uh, the, the peace that Rome, when Rome conquered the world, they brought about a tremendous amount of stability. But the, there was a price to pay for that stability. And, of course, the price that was paid for stability was control. So the Roman garrisons would be in certain areas. Their troops would occupy. You see it. Of course, you see it in the scriptures. And there in Palestine, with the, you, know, you see it all throughout the Gospels and the book of Acts. You see the Roman soldiers everywhere. What were they there to do? To keep the peace of Rome. And how do they do that? By oppressing the people, by keeping them in line. That rod of iron, if you would, uh, Brother David. And, and so this is, when you think about, this is how the world brings about peace. It's a removal of conflict, but there's a price to be paid for the removal of conflict. And part of that price, of course, is a lack of freedom or an oppression or even to the fact of the removal of those that would oppose whatever that peace would be. And so if you remove the troublemakers, then you have peace. And so this is, this is what, I, you know, as far as the end times go, as far as the, the, the tribulation period, this is, the, this is the type of peace that is going to be brought into the world and try to establish a, um, a covenant or a treaty with the nation of Israel and try to establish some type of global peace. There's always a price that has to be paid. When, when God brings peace, it, 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 it comes in a different way. When, when mankind brings peace, it, it's, it's not one of those, you know, everything's groovy and, and we're all just going to get along, okay? You know, all I am saying, give peace a chance. Okay, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful song, okay? But, the, but the, what's behind it doesn't work because mankind is a sinner and... The only way that you can achieve peace is the way the world gives peace, and that is with oppression, which it's, it's with um, removal of, of freedoms and liberties, uh, it's, it's with uh, control, and often with brutality in order to keep everything where it needs to be. That's the way the world gives peace. It often costs something and costs it dearly, okay? So, Daniel chapter 9 is where we see the covenant being brought in. And please notice also, if you're, if you're still there, 927, please notice also, and it says, 
Um, it was now covered with for one week, and in the midst of the week, we'll talk about this in a little bit. Um, he shall, he shall, um, in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Okay, so let's talk about sacrifice and oblation. What does that mean? He will cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. So if you see that, you, you just read that verse. What does that imply? In order for it to cease, it has to have been going on, right? So what does that imply? There's a temple there. You said it. There's a... There's a temple. There's a temple. Okay. All right. Um, because the Jews, they're under command not to sacrifice anywhere except where God has put his name. And that is the city of Jerusalem... And that is the temple that God has, uh, the place where God has put his name. So we're not talking about, you know, Brooklyn, New York, all right? And some, you know, some synagogue over there in Brooklyn. Um, we're talking about the city of Jerusalem, the temple mound, a temple being built there. That's the implication. If it says that during the midst of the tribulation, that the sacrifice is going to be cut off, that means that for the first half of the tribulation, there is a temple in Jerusalem. That's what it means, okay? So, let's see here. I'm going to draw the temple. How's that look? Let's see. We'll do this. We'll do that. And I'm going to put a Star of David on the front. How's that sound? Does that work for you? Okay? And um, so... There'll be a temple in there. I'm going to draw a line right here because that's where the Holy of Holies is at, right back there. All right. So, can the Jews build a temple in Jerusalem? Well, you know, there's there's been a lot of there, there's been there's a, been a lot of Jewish organizations um, that have, have come and gone, I suppose, and there's still some today that are that are um, they are desirous to see a temple built. And, I mean, if you read, you know, any of the articles that, that come up, I've read a few books about the subject, and there's always stuff online about it, um, in preparation, there's, you know, there's folks that are doing, uh, and this is what I've read, I, I don't know how much of it's true, uh, folks that are uh, doing DNA analysis to find out what tribes different people are from, to try to find uh, those that are descendants from the tribe of Levi, so they can have a priesthood that comes from those descendants, um, there are folks that are raising red heifers. Why do we need? Red, why do they need red heifers? Anybody know? You, you look at the scriptures. You find out that the red, the, with the, when, you, when you burn a red heifer, you take the ashes of the red heifer. The ashes of the red heifer are needed for for the uh, purifying of the instruments and the clothing that the Levites would use. And so you see that in the scriptures. So there. And this is just stuff I read, okay? Um, that there, there, there are herds of red heifers being raised. Uh, the implements that are being used, that will be used in the temple, have been built by certain organizations, be ready to, to put in place. There, um, this is going back. This was back in the eighties. I remember, I remember this, and this was not just you know some kind of mem I read. That I said, they didn't have mems back in the eighties. Was that memes? Anyway, you spell it any way you want, but. Um, um, they were there was a there was a uh, there was a uh, a group of zealots that were ready to storm the temple mound. They had a foundation stone that they were going to set on the temple mound as the be and to to begin the construction of the new Jewish temple. All right. So this this is this is stuff that's been going on a long time. Um, there, so there are groups out there that are eager. To build the temple. As a matter of fact, um, if if there was a peace treaty signed tomorrow in the Middle East, and the Arabs uh, and the Israelis sat and they shook their hands and, and they both agreed that each other exists and that they could share Jerusalem and they could share the Temple Mount, you can be assured that there would be construction getting started almost immediately on the Temple Mount for a new temple in Jerusalem. Um, that's how eager the Jewish people are to do that. So, Antichrist, who's on the first, I believe, the first horseman, 
um, at the conclusion of the Gog and Magog, begins to establish a global peace, which includes a covenant, um, which is brings peace in the Middle East. And if, if it's if the if the if the political environment is the same as it is today, that means that they there has to be an agreement between the Jews and the Arabs. And if that's the case, then an agreement is made, and then the Jews immediately start to build the temple on the Temple Mount. Okay. Now a lot of discussions. What's what's on the Temple Mount right now? Okay. There's not there's not a Pizza Hut. Okay. Uh, what's on the Temple What's on the Temple Mount? Dome Rock. Okay. Which is a what? That is not a fast food place either. Okay. It's a it's a mosque, okay? It's a it's a, a Muslim mosque. It's on there. It's a beautiful building. Been in there. I had to take my shoes off, but I've been in there, okay? Um, uh, the um, it, it's a when you when you go in, um, the central part of that is a, a large area that's cordoned off by a you know like marble um, railing all the way around it, and that is there's a rock there, the dome of the rock, okay? The rock is significant for the for the Arab world because they believe that's where Muhammad ascended up into heaven, and I think he then he reappeared uh, some other city. But anyway, that's where he ascended up from that from that spot. It is uh, the second most holiest place uh, in in the Arab religion, the Muslim religion. Okay, um, but that rock also is believed to be the threshing floor of Arnon. Um, significant for two things, okay? First of all, do you remember the story where David is numbering the armies and then God sends the angel and slaying all the people and, and David repents of that and the angel is stayed there uh, and God says for him then to sacrifice and they sacrifice. Well, that's the, that's the spot. That's the threshing floor where the angel was stayed and that's the spot uh, that Temple Mount area, that's where that's where all that took place. It's also believed to be the spot where um, Abraham took his son Isaac and would sacrifice him there. And God stopped him. And then God provided himself a lamb. And that all would have taken place on that spot. So it's a very sacred place for the Arabs. In reference to Muhammad, and for the Jews, of course, in reference to both that uh, with, with David and, and, of course, with Abraham. But when the first temple was built, it was built on that mound where Abraham was told to sacrifice his son Isaac. And that is the temple mound. So right now, of course, the Dome of the Rock is there. And the big question is, you know, can, can both uh, of those... Um, Buildings be on the Temple Mount, so that's that's been a great amount of debate. I, you know, you can read the books and articles and things like that. Um, if you I mean, get online, get, get, get Google Earth or or just open your Maps program and just take a look at that Temple Mount. You'll see it's a pretty big spot up there. Um, to um, let's see, which way is east? This is east, going that way. The Eastern Gate is right there. Um, the Dome of the Rock is right here. The eastern gate is over just a little, just a wee bit, and then there's a big open space right, here. big open space right here, right next to the dome of the rock, and, uh, and the, the northern gate to the Temple Mound is right over here, and that just goes down the road around the corner. That's where Stephen's gate is at. That's where it's believed that Stephen was uh, martyred at. Uh, over this way is the um, is the Sheep Gate, and then over that way is the Dung Gate. That's where they took the garbage out at. Um, but there's a big spot right there, and it's sufficient uh, as far as uh, areas uh, that you can have the Dome of the Rock and the Jewish Temple. Is it possible? It's possible. Okay. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't think the I don't think the Arab world is. If the, if the peace treaty is going to be signed with the Arabs in order to to satisfy. Um, what Dan of chapter nine has to say, nine twenty-seven. Then I, I don't think there would be a. I don't think it would be an issue, and I don't think they have to destroy the Dome uh, of the Rock in order for that to take place. Um, if there's a mutual understanding, uh, the Jews would not hesitate 
Uh, would it take him long to build a temple? I don't think it would take him long at all. Um, my, this is my own personal opinion about this. Uh, there's one thing that would spark the desire to build a temple more than anything, and not just a peace tree. And that's the discovery of the Ark of the Covenant. Exactly right. Um, if they found the Ark, and Eric's got a big grin on his face. Where's it at? Area 51. Area 51. Okay, there we go. Okay. So, because some alien spaceships sucked it up, you know, 2,000 years ago. Oh, was it? Okay. I thought it was in, the Washington, in a warehouse in Washington, D.C. I don't know. Okay. Well, I can make it right. All right. So, there's, a, there's so many so many different uh, speculations as far as the uh, location of the Ark of the Covenant. It just disappeared. It, I mean, you don't see it. Um, when the Romans destroyed the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD, General Titus of the Roman, um, the, after they destroyed that, they built a, uh, what's it called, the, Ark, the, the Arch of Triumph, I think, in Rome. Um, and it's got... It's got um, uh, an engraving all around there about that defeat. And you see, um, just get online, take a look at it. You'll see uh, there, there are stone reliefs. And so on those reliefs, you see the Romans carrying out the treasure, if you would, from Jerusalem, which includes the big, men the big menorah. You know, because in the temple, they have the big candlestick, right? So you see them carrying the candlestick out. It's very obviously the menorah, the Jewish thing. And, and other items coming from the temple, but you don't see anywhere on that relief, you don't see uh, the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, that would be an obvious thing. If there was a prize that the Romans would want to show off, look what we got, it would be the Ark of the Covenant, but you don't see it on the stone relief. So I don't believe it was in the temple at all. Now, it's possible that it hasn't, hadn't been there for several hundred years. Because most people believe it, it disappeared um, at the time when the Babylonians came. That couple, several things could have happened. The Babylonians could have taken it, and that's a possibility, but the Bible doesn't say that, so I don't know. Uh, some people believe that Jeremiah or one of the others uh, in that group that went down to Egypt took it with them to Egypt. Um, it's also believed, um, if, you, if, you, um, if you've ever seen any of the apocryphal works, for instance, First and Second Maccabees from the Apocrypha, there is actually a reference in the Apocrypha to the Ark of the Covenant being buried in a, in a cave over in uh, the land of Moab. And so this is one of those, this is one of those like, um, interesting little tidbits that a lot of people have kind of followed through, because if you if you take, remember I mentioned about the Eastern Gate, okay? If, if you take the Eastern Gate and you line it up with uh, where they believe that the Holy of Holies was at on the Temple Mount, and you draw a straight line, it goes right to the mountains of Moab. And so a lot of people get this, this thing in their mind, you know, that, that if you if you follow that line out and you dig in the mountains of Moab. Along that line, eventually you're going to find the cave where the Ark of the Covenant is at. Okay, so if you got nothing going on over the next couple of years and you want to you want a project, there you go. All right. Um, it's also believed that it's simply buried underneath the Temple Mount, and you never know what. The, can you guess what the Jews have been doing ever since they've taken over um, the city of Jerusalem? They've been digging underneath the Temple Mount, and of course the Arabs have a Fit. They, I mean, it causes riots uh, once, they, once the Arabs find out that the Jews are tunneling and doing different things. Because they're tunneling underneath the Dome of the Rock, their sacred place. And so one of the things they're doing, it's, it's archaeological, certainly. But one of the things they're looking for is, is the Ark of the Covenant. If they found the Ark of the Covenant, that, I don't, it would not be long at all before they want a temple in order to place it. So this is this is the this this is the begin this is the, the, the first three and a half years of the tribulation. A temple will be reestablished, and I, I myself personally I believe that it will center around the the, uh, the fact that the Ark of the Covenant is discovered, and and I can't you know 
I'm only saying that because I know that would be one thing that would push them to wanting a temple and as quickly as they possibly could. And so these three and a half years, there was going to be a, a, the, the construction of the temple. The, let me just say there, when we started this whole thing, it was uh, we started with a lesson on um, the uh, imminent return of Christ, that doctrine of imminency. In other words, nothing has to happen uh, before Jesus comes back. So... First of all, there doesn't have to be a temple in Jerusalem for Jesus Christ to come back. We're talking about the rapture, all right? We're not talking about the second coming. We're talking about rapture, okay? So there doesn't have to be a temple in place. There doesn't have to be an antichrist walking around going, hey, you know, my name is Antichrist, you know, follow me. That doesn't have to exist. There doesn't have to be a war in place, global war. Um, so there's a lot of things that don't have to be in place. Um, but I do believe that once that this event happens here, which is, of course, we all know next Tuesday, all those things start falling in line extremely quickly. A lot of things unfold. It's like dynamically all just one after the other after the other. Okay? So global wars, the rise of the Antichrist, peace treaties, the beginning of the construction of the temple. Who knows? The beginning of the construction of the temple may be the thing that sparks the war that the Antichrist steps in and causes, you know, this global peace and a peace treaty to take place. It, it, that could be that could be the whole premise. Somebody finds the Ark of the Covenant and all of a sudden, boom, everything just cuts loose. So all that is in place by this mid part of the tribulation, and that's what Daniel chapter 9 and verse number 27 is telling us that there's a temple, that there's sacrifices being made, and that there is a global peace which is allowing it all to take place. And in the midst of that treaty, which is it's a seven-year treaty, all of a sudden everything, the big switch takes place. Everything changes. Let's uh, go back to our text here, okay? And uh, i got about five minutes and i got gobs of stuff to do, so we're going to, this is going to be quick. Now, nah, we'll just probably save most of this for, for uh, the week after next. I'm over here next week. All right. Um, please notice back in our text here, verse number 27. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And for the overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate. Okay. Um, this is what we're talking about as a desolation that takes place. The overspreading of desolation. In other words, it's like... It's like he spreads his wing and brings a tremendous horror to that whole setting. So what we're talking about is that Temple Mount area or every, anything associated with, because this is in Jerusalem, okay? So anything associated with what's going on, on the, uh, with, the with the Jews and with the Temple Mount and with the sacrifices, okay? Uh, go with me, if you would, please, to... Um, Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. This, um, we've been here a couple times already in our lessons, and Matthew 24 and 25 are, uh, are tribulation passages. They're, they're, these are things that are leading up to the second coming of Christ and not to the rapture, all right? Just to, just to remind everybody. And so if you look at verse number 15 and 16, when ye, uh, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, that's what we're reading this, uh, this morning already, uh, stand in the holy place. Now, what's the holy place? We're talking about the temple in Jerusalem. So the Antichrist is going to be standing in the holy place. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in, Jer in Judea flee into the mountains. So this is a warning to the Jewish population in Jerusalem that the Antichrist, what he's going to be doing at this point is um, um, he's going to be uh, allowing this peace treaty to be signed. Israel is going to, it's going to have all this tremendous uh, freedom to rebuild the temple, to start their worship uh, again with the Ark of the Covenant, I believe. Uh, and then the, the Antichrist is now going to come to the Temple Mound. And I want, to, I want you to take a look at another uh, verse with me. We read this again a couple weeks ago. And that's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We were there and we were speaking about uh, the, um, the rapture and the taking. Back, way back here, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we were talking about the removal of the Holy Spirit in that letteth will let. And um, look at verse number 4. Whosoever, let's see, the second. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 4. Oh yeah, that's it. Who oppresseth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he, as God, this is speaking about the Antichrist, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So this is the event. This is where the Antichrist finally says, you know, I've had enough of this. And he shows himself for who he really is. So he, uh, he moves into the temple and sets himself up as God. And this marks a tremendous turn in the events in the, in the, uh, of the tribulation. Now, it's been bad. Now, please, don't think that it's all been peachy here. There's a lot of things going on. Those four horsemen that are mentioned in Revelation chapter 6, that a lot, that's all happening here. And because of whatever this war is back in Gog and Magog, there is a lot of destruction. There's a lot of famine. Folks are dying every day. Uh, it's, a, it's a really tough time to be around. But the nation of Israel is allowed through this peace treaty to reestablish the temple. And let me let me ask you, would you if, if you were if you were Jewish, okay, and so you've been living you know in, in Podunk Holler, Texas all your life, and all of a sudden you hear they they've rebuilt the temple. Um, how how would you how would you react react to that? Um, what's that? Go back home. Brother? That's exactly right. You know, in, 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 19, in 1948, when Israel became a nation, um, hundreds of thousands of Jews all around the world were, were coming back to Jerusalem because Israel was now a nation. And, um, I mean, they were populating the area. Um, there were Jews from, uh, of course, all the Eastern European Jews that had been a part of all the oppression that went on during World War II. They're coming in. Um, I was. I read an article. I don't know, decades ago, about the uh, population of, of, of black Jews from Africa that were coming in. It was just an amazing um, a reminder that Judaism really has spread in so many different areas of this world. And um, after after Israel became a nation in 1948, folks were coming in from all over the world, coming to Jerusalem, wanting to be there because they were Jewish. And this was their land, and they could finally be at home, although they had never been there before in their entire lives. This was now home for them. We think about that a hundred times over when the temple's built. And so when, when I think about the fact that the Bible reminds us that during the tribulation period, God is going to be, going to be dealing with the nation of Israel again as a people. I believe one of the ways he brings that about is through the construction of the temple and the Jewish population that is still scattered all over this world is going to flock back to Jerusalem so that they can be a part of this grand thing that has just taken place. So that's going to provide a couple things, though. Okay? First of all, it's going to be threatening to the surrounding area because if, if you... Um, if you've ever read anything about the couple of the wars that took place, for instance, the Yom Kippur War and, se and the uh, Seven Day War that took place, um, in, in the, we'll talk about the Arab countries that invaded the, uh, the nation of Israel. At, this is you know post World War II, and one of the reasons for that is because the, ex the, the expansion of the nation of Israel after World War II it, it was threatening to the so there there's Imagine even more Jews coming back to, to Palestine. And so, although there's a treaty, there's going to be some tension. 
So I believe that tension may also lead up to this. But another thing it's going to do is going to provide a perfect opportunity for the evangelism of the Jewish people. Because I know from the scriptures, and you know this too, Paul the Apostle said, all Israel shall be saved. Now that's a really bold statement. So if you, you, if you, if you get an entire population of people to come back to a geographic area for a very specific purpose, and that is to reestablish worship in the city of Jerusalem, you have an opportunity now of, of this evangelism to take place. And we're... This is what we're going to cover next time. We're going to talk about the method by which this evangelism takes place. Any, any guesses? YouTube videos. No, I'm just kidding. All right. Um, any, any guesses? I'll give you two. Oh, there it is. Okay. You got both of them, brother. We're going to talk about two witnesses next time because God has a plan for the nation of Israel. Remember the 144,000? Their ministry is not, is not a Jewish ministry. 144,000, although they were Jewish people, their ministry is directed primarily to the Gentile world. But God is going to deal with the Jewish people. And one of the ways he's going to do that is by bringing them all back together and then having these two, raising these two witnesses up. All right, we've got to end right there. Thank you so much for being in Sunday School this morning. Lord bless you.